Excellent. Well, oh, thank you uh, very much for that kind introduction. And uh, it's, it's a great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, it's my first time in, in, in Brazil. And um, it seems to be a very wonderful place. So uh, I'm very look, much looking forward to a long and extended uh, collaboration. So uh, what I'm going to do is just give a bit of an overview uh, of the placenta. Um, which is an organ that many people have sort of rather ignored over the, over the years. Um, but I think uh, in, in recent years, uh, it has had a bit of a revival. Uh, and now I think the implications of placental function for embryonic development are much better appreciated. And part of this is, is really the work of, of David Barker and his... Uh, putting forward the theory of developmental origins of, of, of health and disease. Uh, so as you, as you know, uh, David's, oops, David's work showed that uh, there is a relationship between uh, birth weight and cardiovascular disease and now many other diseases uh, of adult life. And when he first put the, the, the uh, theories forward, it was very much in the terms of maternal nutrition uh, and that these uh, low birth weight babies out here, which had the uh, poorer uh, or the, um, outcomes in, in later life, uh, were related to maternal nutrition. Uh, but we had to sort of remind uh, David, and we had some very interesting meetings with him, that in fact there is uh, an organ situated in between uh, the mother and the fetus. So yes, we know that nutritional state, oxygen availability, stress, and, and other factors uh, from the maternal environment can affect the fetus, and there is an interaction between the genotype of the fetus uh, and, and its phenotype, and we get these postnatal uh, complications and programming of, of fetal metabolism, cardiovascular disease. But it's not a direct link between the mother and the fetus. There is this organ, the placenta, which is sitting in between. Uh, and uh, David sort of ultimately became very interested actually in placental uh, research. And some of his later papers were related very much to placental shape uh, uh, and, and predictions of cardiovascular uh, and other problems. So what I, uh, I mean, there are many ways in which the placenta can uh, influence the uh, fetal development. Uh, in terms of its definition, it is simply defined as an apposition or fusion of the fetal membranes to the uterine mucosa for the purposes of exchange. That is what most people think about the placenta and obviously maternal transport is probably its most important function, but it is performing a variety of other activities uh, because it is functioning as both the, the fetal lung, the fetal gut, uh, the kidneys for excretion of waste products. It also has important metabolic activities and also endocrine activities and, and impairment of any of these can of course influence fetal development. And so I'm gonna to just touch on a few of these uh, various different activities um, of the placenta in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So let's start with materno-fetal transport because that's really what most people think about the, 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 the placenta. Just to introduce you to the, the, the structure of the organ, this is a, a freshly delivered placenta it weighs something like 500 grams. It's about 20 centimeters in diameter, three to four centimeters thick. And if you were to take a cross section through this tissue, you would see this uh, sort of uh, representation here, which was drawn by Elizabeth Ramsey. Uh, 
Uh, and it shows you the, the face of the placenta that's um, opposite the baby with the umbilical cord attached. We call this the chorionic plate. Uh, and it has its undersurface, the basal plate, which is opposed to the actual wall of the uterus. And inside that placenta, there is a very elaborately branched series of villus trees, which are fetal in origin. These are the same genotype as the fetus. They are all uh, fetal tissues. And these branch repeatedly and they give us an enormous surface area for exchange. So we get something like 12 to 14 square meters of tissue uh, for, for the exchange. Inside those uh, villi, as we'll see, are branches of the fetal uh, blood vessels, which are coming down the umbilical cord, uh, and they will then perform their exchange function and then be delivered back to the uh, fetus. And the only really maternal contribution to this organ is the maternal blood <coughs> that is delivered here through this uh, basal plate. And at this point, we just uh, erode into the maternal arteries and the blood is just released into the cavity of the placenta and it flows between all these villi and then drains out through the veins. So, Technically, this is a hemochorial placenta because the interface is between the maternal blood, the heme, and the villi associated with the chorion. So if we were to look at these villi uh, here in um, more detail, that's a scanning electron micrograph of the villi. They're short, little stubby uh, protuberances which are covered in turn by microvilli, which give us a, a further amplification for receptor expression. And as I say, within those villi, you will have branches of the fetal capillaries. You can see those here. This is stained with a, a lectin, which has pulled out the, uh, the endothelial cells, whilst the trophoblast surface is, is outlined with uh, the red dye or we can fill up the uh, fetal blood vessels with a resin and then digest away the tissue so we get a little cast of the uh, fetal blood vessels. And you can see how very branched these are and also how dilated they are in certain places. And those dilations are very important because if we take a cross section through this sort of tissue, and look with the normal uh, transmission electron microscope, you will see the actual maternofetal interface. So this tissue here with the microvilli is the syncytiotrophoblast, which is covering the uh, villi. Inside the villi, we have the fetal capillaries. And where they're very dilated, they come to the surface and the distance between the maternal uh, blood out here, and the fetal blood here is reduced to something like two to three micrometers, two to three thousandth of a millimeter. So these are very, very similar really to the alveoli of the lung in a way that you've got a very um, thin interface uh, between the two circulations. And that is obviously going to help with uh, exchange of nutrients, particularly if, they, if, if it's done by simple diffusion. So we've got a very large surface area. We've got a relatively thin uh, barrier. How do things cross this, this barrier from one circulation to the other? <coughs> this is really a summary of the different uh, ways in which nutrients can pass between the two. So we've got mother up here, fetus down here, and the placental membrane just uh, cartooned in between. So the simplest way of transport is, is passive diffusion. Substances can diffuse across the membrane in either direction uh, between the two circulations. And that is certainly the case for the respiratory gases. It is thought to be uh, the case for free fatty acids as well and urea. Uh, 
uh, and the rate of diffusion is going to be dependent on the surface area for exchange and the inversely proportional to the thickness of that membrane. For nutrients which can't cross the, lipo, uh, uh, the, the, the lipid membranes, we have transporter-mediated uh, mechanisms. We have both active and passive transporters. So these ones over here are not dependent on ATP. They are simply transporter proteins embedded in the uh, lipid membrane and they will facilitate diffusion several hundred or even a thousand fold. The classic examples for those are the GLUT transporter proteins uh, and the, the fats which will again uh, transport some free fatty acids. So glucose and again fatty acids can probably pass by simple diffusion and also facilitated diffusion. And then we have uh, the transporters for amino acids, some of which are not actually dependent on ATP, but are exchanging amino acids across, uh, dependent on uh, the electrical gradient um, between the, the two circulations. Uh, and then there are the ATP dependent um, transporters, which will actually transfer uh, amino acids against a concentration gradient. Uh, and then finally, there is endocytosis or exocytosis, so that there is vesicular transport. Uh, receptors bind uh, particular proteins on the surface, form it into a coated vesicle, and that is then transported out onto the basal surface. So transport across the placenta can be quite complicated. Uh, simple diffusion, these transporter-mediated processes, there's going to be receptors both in the apical membrane and in the basal membrane of the trophoblast, and the density of those transporters is going to be different because some of the nutrients coming into the placenta will actually be utilized by the placenta itself, and we'll come to that uh, towards the end. But in terms of how the placenta can adapt, uh, it can obviously change its surface area and vascularity, but also in this, uh, on these processes, we can actually increase the density of the transporter proteins embedded in the membrane, and I'll show you some evidence of, of, of that. So just to... to Recap, this is the, the, the sort of FIC equation that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, but it's surface area times the diffusion coefficient, which is the solubility of the nutrient uh, in, the, in the tissue, times the maternofetal concentration gradient, and that is an important factor, and we'll see how the placenta can modulate uh, that as well, uh, and inversely proportional to the thickness of the villus membrane. So how can we see, how can we test how adaptable the, the, the placenta is to these uh, different uh, stresses? Well, many complications of pregnancy are associated with so-called hypoxia. I say so-called hypoxia because nobody has actually measured the oxygen concentration in cases of preeclampsia or growth restriction. But the general, if you read many, many accounts, you will see that it is said that the placenta is hypoxic. The one condition where you can say the, that the placenta is exposed to a low oxygen is actually at high altitude. Because there, the inspired uh, PO2 is, is going to be, uh, what's going on here? quite low. So as you go up in, in, in altitude, the, uh, the percentage composition of, the, of the, the atmospheric gas is obviously the same, but it is just that there is less gas available. And so at 4,000 meters, you only inspire about 60% of the oxygen molecules that you would do at sea level. So here we know 
that the maternal arterial oxygen tension is reduced to something like 60 uh, millimeters of mercury. So what happens if you look at those placentas from women who've been resident at, at high altitude? Well, what you see in, in terms of the surface area of the villi, if you look within the, 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 the placenta, there's not really any increase in the surface area of the villi themselves, but inside those villi, the fetal capillaries are very much more extensive. So there's a, a, an increase in the vascularity on, on the fetal side of the placenta. That uh, will obviously uh, improve your opportunity for diffusion but also it has an effect on the thickness of the vellus membrane so that there is a significant reduction in, in, in the thickness. And if you put those sort of values into the Fick equation, what you find is that the theoretical diffusing capacity of the placenta is actually almost doubled uh, between about 3,000 meters and, and, and sea level. So there's there's a lot of debate in the literature as to whether placental weight changes or not uh, at high altitude. Uh, what nobody has ever um, debated really is whether the vascularity uh, is different and, and, and everybody agrees that uh, the villi are more vascularized at high altitude, increasing the theoretical diffusing capacity. So that's just an example. Of, of how the placenta can adapt under a situation where it's exposed to uh, chronic hypoxia. If we're interested in, in, in changes in relation to nutrition, that is harder to do in the, in the human. So we've turned to animal models uh, and uh, in, in we, we've used the mouse uh, for a lot of this sort of work. So <clears throat> this is the uh, typical sort of mouse pup. And what you know with that placenta is a discoid hemochorial placenta, so similar in many ways to the human. The difference is that we can recognize two different zones within the placenta, a labyrinth zone here, which is where all the maternal fetal exchange takes place, and a junctional zone, as it is called here, which has the more endocrine functions of the placenta. So in the human, the same structure, the same villi, perform both transport and endocrine function. In the rodent placenta, uh, you've separated those two functions into a transport zone and an endocrine zone. So here's a, a relatively simple uh, experiment uh, that mothers were fed 80% uh, of a normal diet. So this was a not a, a high fat or low protein diet, it was a normal diet, but they were just restricted in the amount of nutrients that they had, and they were fed, uh, that was throughout uh, pregnancy. And if you measure the size of those two different zones of the placenta, what you find is that in the undernourished uh, mothers, the placenta has a greater proportion of area de dedicated to exchange uh, and a proportionally a smaller area for endocrine function. So here we've got a structural adaptation within the placenta in response to a change in, in simply the amount of maternal nutrients. We can go a little bit further with the mouse in that we can actually perform in vitro transport assays. So we can inject the mother with labeled uh, lethal AIB, which is a, a amino acid analog, and actually measure in vivo how much of that is being transported across into the, into the fetus. Uh, this is done at day 16, which is the time of maximum growth of the placenta, and at day 19, which is the period of maximum growth of the fetus. 
And as you can see that uh, there is uh, an increased rate of actual transport across the placenta uh, at both gestational ages, particularly uh, at day 19. So that might be due to the increased relative surface area in those mice. But actually, when you look for the amino acid transporters, you can't look at the protein because there aren't very good antibodies, but we can look at the RNA encoding those. And what we see is that this particular transporter, SLC38A2, is significantly increased in the undernourished, uh, in, in, the, in the pups from undernourished uh, dams. So that is an example of a response to maternal diet where there is both a structural change and uh, a change in, in, in the expression of amino acid transporters. Uh, and in terms of the, we, we believe this is a sort of compensatory change which is trying to maximize growth of the fetus. And we see exactly the same if we make the placenta genetically smaller uh, and it's exactly the same actually as within normal variation of placental size uh, you see in, in normal mothers. So to cut a, quite a long story uh, short, I think it is, is, is now very clear that the placenta is not just a passive conduit of nutrients from mother to fetus, but that there are certainly signals that are passing from the mother to the placenta or the placenta is responding to, to, to nutrient availability. But it is also responding to signals coming from the fetus, uh, which are probably regulating those amino acid transporters. So it's a very much more an active dialogue between all three participants, the, the, the mother, the placenta, and the fetus and, and, and we've, we don't know exactly what those signals are as yet but we are trying to dissect some of those pathways uh, using genetic and other approaches but it does seem that these imprinted genes which have a, a parent of origin uh, expression and are only really found in the placenta and uh, in the brain where they again control reproductive behavior you see the same sort of pattern of imprinted genes being involved in maternal fetal resource allocation in mammals as you actually do in, in plants as well. And so I think there's, there's a huge area to, to explore really on, on how these, these mechanisms between mother and offspring relationship have, have evolved uh, over the millennia. So, as time is short, I, I shall just um, leave transport there and, and consider uh, the role of the placenta in terms of arterial, maternal arterial remodeling. So one of the things the placenta has to do every time it, uh, in every pregnancy is to establish its own blood supply from the mother. Uh, and most complications of human pregnancy, which are not associated with infection or maternal diet, are associated with deficient uh, blood supply to the, to the placenta. So where does it, it get those, uh, where does it get its blood supply from? It comes from branches of the uterine artery, which ramify through the wall of the uterus. Uh, and then when the placenta develops, it invades into those arteries uh, and uh, taps the maternal blood. There is a danger uh, in doing that um, because obviously you're invading into a high pressure system. And so those maternal arteries have to be remodeled uh, extensively in early pregnancy. And so this is a, a depiction of, an, of a non-pregnant uh, spiral artery. And you can see that it, it contains a large amount of smooth muscle in the, in the wall of that vessel. And during uh, pregnancy, those arteries are remodeled 
so that they lose that smooth muscle uh, and as a consequence, the mouth of the artery dilates as it approaches uh, the, the placenta. So this is a, a fully converted uh, artery. You can see that there's no smooth muscle there. This is replaced by a, just a fibrinoid material, an inert uh, material that can't contract. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, the lumen of that artery is greatly uh, increased. And, and obviously that's gonna have a profound impact on blood flow uh, as we'll see. How do we remodel those arteries? Well trophoblast cells from the placenta invade into the wall of the uterus and they penetrate usually as far as the inner third of the myometrium of the muscle layer of the uterus uh, and that is uh, that they will remodel this part of, of the artery and everything stained in brown here uh, is a trophoblast cell. So they come down the, the lumen of the arteries, they come down in between the arteries. Uh, what? <clears throat> so this is the... Um, the sort of proposed mechanism for conversion, we, we, we still don't understand uh, the molecular uh, process completely, but we start off on this side with a normal uh, smooth muscle coating to the vessel wall uh, and endothelial cells. And uh, in early pregnancy, there is a swelling of both the muscle and the endothelial cells uh, they lose their intercellular connections uh, and then the, there is either going to be loss of the smooth muscle cells through apoptosis or they de-differentiate. But the end result is, is that we lose all that smooth muscle and instead there is this fibrin uh, deposited which will trap uh, some of the trophoblast cells uh, within it. Now that loosening of those smooth muscle cells uh, and in perhaps the apoptosis and the migration is heavily dependent on proteases which are thought to come from either the trophoblast cells or from interactions uh, with the maternal immune cells. So this is the, 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 the uh, sort of molecular process. So obviously as these cells migrate through the uh, endometrium. They are, of course, fetal cells. They do express paternal antigens, and so they will interact with all of the immune cells which are present in the wall of the uterus. And the particular ones of interest are what are known as the uterine natural killer cells, cells of the innate uh, immune system, which are the most numerous ones underneath the placenta and about 70% of your lymphocytes in this region will be uh, natural killer cells. So these cells are, are, are very numerous uh, and we see that uh, we see a very close association between the natural killer cells which are stained here in, in purple uh, and the trophoblast cells which are stained uh, with the cytokeratin in, in, in brown. So there are extensive interactions between those two cell types. There is no cell killing of the trophoblast, uh, but there is a dialogue between the two. And uh, Ashley Moffitt's work in Cambridge has shown that certain combinations of ligands on the trophoblast cells and the receptors on the natural killer cells predict or, or they certain combinations increase your risk of complications of pregnancy. So you certainly need activation of the natural killer cells probably to release those proteases but uh, you and um, if that doesn't happen then you're going to get deficient conversion of the arteries. So why is conversion of the arteries so uh, 
important. This is what uh, a spiral artery actually looks like as it approaches the placenta, and you see this enormous dilation uh, just at the mouth. And this was done, uh, some serial reconstructions in, in 1966 when people were getting pregnancy hysterectomy specimens. We did some little mathematical modeling, uh, taking these sort of dimensions and saying, what is the impact of that dilation on blood flow into the placenta? And what you've got here is, is the, the speed of flow predicted by the model. This is a logarithmic scale uh, dependent on the, the radius of, of these arteries. So if we go to an artery which is about this sort of di di diameter over here, we predict that the inflow of blood, which is given by these two solid lines, dependent on the precise viscosity of the blood, but you're in the region of something like two to three meters per second, which is typical arterial blood flow. If you dilate, to the, the, the sort of 2.5 millimeters dimensions over here, then you bring that down by an order of magnitude. The, the blood is flowing into the placenta now, not at two to three meters per second, which would probably destroy those delicate fetal villi, but is now flowing in at about 10 centimeters per second. And that is one of the crucial points as to, to why uh, dilation of these vessels is, is, is so important. It also removes the vasoreactivity of the vessel wall, so the mother is no longer able to constrict the blood supply to the placenta. So the fetus is very clever, the placenta is very clever by taking over the maternal circulation in this way. And just to show you, I hope these will, will show up, but uh, this is a couple of, of ultrasound scans that were provided by uh, John Kingdom. Uh, over here, we've got a normal uh, pr uh, pregnancy. Uh, over here, we've got one which was associated with severe growth restriction and deficient conversion of those arteries. So what John does is just to move up and down through the placenta uh, with, his, with his scan and what you will see over here is that you've got a quite a nice normal shaped placenta. It's, it's quite elliptical, uh, but you will see little dark spaces appear in the placenta, which are holes, and these are a normal feature of the placenta, but they are dark, and that means that there's very little blood. Well, the, the, the blood that is within those is not flowing at a high velocity, whereas in this one, you can already see that that space there is, is, is looking quite gray. So I'll, I'll just show you if I can. Uh, this one. You see it towards the end, there's going to be some black spaces in the placenta uh, that, are, that are relatively dark. I can and play that again. It's the same darkness as in the ventricles of the brain, but uh, there was one there that was quite normal. This one, on the other hand, is you can already see that the placenta has got a very different shape. It's uh, much more globular. It's uh, and what you'll see is is a number of different channels uh, within the placenta, and the blood. There's, is a, there's a gray shimmering effect um, because the blood is flowing through at such a fast pace. Um, so there you see these huge channels uh, and this, this, this blood is going through at a, a tremendous speed uh, through these. So, <clears throat> that conversion 
is, is very, very uh, important. And as I say, most cases of IUGR which are not associated with maternal malnutrition will be associated with poor conversion of the spiral arteries. Uh, and if we look in those placentas, this is a, uh, the typical IUGR looking placenta. It is rather irregular in its shape. It is, uh, if you look inside, there's very few uh, terminal villi and the trophoblast on the surface is, is looking quite sort of unhealthy uh, with very dilated uh, organelles compared to the uh, normal situation. So the surface area for exchange is going to be very uh, much less in these sort of cases uh, and the well-being of the trophoblast is going to be uh, impaired. So all of the result of very high flow rates through which are affecting uh, the trophoblast. So <clears throat> both of those are related to sort of maternal fetal transport, as is also many of the aspects of endocrine activity. So the placenta is a huge endocrine organ. Uh, it, most people uh, sort of forget the metabolic requirements of the placenta, but it is actually using about a third of the oxygen that is taken up by the uterus. Uh, a third of it is, is being used by the placenta for its own metabolic needs. So this is the syncytia trophoblast, that outer layer of the, of the, of the placenta. It is a, a true multinucleated syncytium. It's a very unusual uh, cell biology there. There are no intercellular clefts between these nuclei. Um, <clears throat> and it is this that is doing the active transport, but as I say in the human, also producing uh, the peptide and steroid hormones. So that's just stained for human chorionic gonadotrophin. And again, as we sort of talked with the Fick equation, it's not just surface area and, and thickness that is important. It is also the maternofetal concentration gradient uh, that is important. So a lot of these hormones produced by the placenta will have a profound impact on maternal metabolism. So take placental growth hormone, for example, it's a member of the placental lactogen and prolactin family. Uh, and as evidence of its profound effect by, by about halfway through pregnancy, the maternal secretion of her own growth hormone from the pituitary is completely suppressed. The placenta is producing so much that the mother's pituitary goes uh, into quiescence. But this will antagonize the peripheral actions of insulin in the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissues so that blood glucose levels go up. Uh, it also promotes lipolysis so that free fatty acids also increase. Uh, and of course, if you've increased those two, uh, then you're in the maternal circulation, you're increasing that concentration gradient difference. Uh, that is going to drive those nutrients into the fetal circulation. So anything which impairs placental endocrine activity uh, is going to uh, have an impact on the uh, transport of, of glucose free fatty acids. So these, these hormones will affect maternal metabolism. They also affect the, 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 the beta cells within her pancreas, the um, Placental lactogen will actually stimulate beta cell proliferation. And again, if that is deficient, you're tending to go into gestational diabetes and other conditions. So the, a lot of different actions of the, the, these hormones. In terms of uh, programming and, and nutrition and, and general fetal well-being, the placenta is transporting a lot of nutrients, but it is also not, or trying to prevent, transport of xenobiotics to the fetus, uh, and also maternal hormones. So 
what the placenta is trying to do is to create a, a micro environment inside the uterus that is uh, protective for the fetus and is blocking the maternal hormones from being transported into the fetal circulation. And these are not just the sex hormones, which would obviously be important, but also particularly uh, maternal cortisol, so that you're allowing the fetal hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis uh, to develop in isolation. Because if, if maternal cortisol came across, uh, you would again suppress uh, that uh, endocrine axis. And we know that glucose corticoids, if you administer them to the fetus, again, prevent proliferation of the fetal cells. So the same syncytiotrophoblast that was transporting nutrients, uh, that was uh, secreting hormones into the maternal circulation, it has enzymes in the uh, epithelium that will actually metabolize maternal uh, cortisol and convert that to the inactive cortisone. So we're, again, protecting uh, the fetus from the maternal stress hormones, uh, inactivating those so that they cannot affect uh, the fetal development. And in addition, this, this trophoblast has a, a variety of efflux transporters which are pushing things out from the trophoblast if, if they got in. Uh, members of the ATP binding cassette family, it's got peak lycoprotein, the multi-drug resistance transporters, breast cancer resistant protein. These are expressed from very, very early on in development and are trying to, to, to block uh, passage of xenobiotics into the fetus. And these are obviously terribly important for teratogenesis uh, and uh, fetal growth. Also, of course, uh, the, it, it contains a, a variety of uh, members of the cytochrome P450 family, uh, which will be metabolizing as much as possible uh, products in things like tobacco, so smoke uh, and alcohol. The action of those enzymes is not as, um, they're not as active as in the liver, uh, but they are present, uh, but they can be overwhelmed as of course, you know, in the fetal alcohol syndrome, so that we, um, you, 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 you can overwhelm these uh, enzymes. But the syncytium is also important because it is in an intact, unique tissue without any cell barriers, it's also providing uh, a barrier against vertical transmission of pathogens. So here, for example, was a study where uh, people were studying how listeria crosses the placenta, because that's one of the, one of the uh, infectious agents that can. The normal syncytiotrophoblast layer provides a degree of protection against transmission and, and listeria is not able to penetrate uh, through the normal trophoblast. There are areas though where the syncytium is, is absent and, and it, there are areas of damage to the, the surface uh, and they found that those were, were ways in which the, 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 the listeria could penetrate into the uh, interior of the villus, uh, and there are other areas where the villi are attached to the, the basal plate of the placenta. Uh, again, that was one of the main routes because they're, they're missing a syncytium, uh, the, the agent could come up through that attachment and infect the, um, the tissues. There are a whole series of macrophages present uh, within the villi which will provide a second line of defense. And essentially the only things which actually cross the placenta have to be able to resist uh, the macrophage uh, uh, attack. So if, if you can survive within a macrophage, then you will be vertically transmitted. 
So lastly, just talk a little bit about uh, the metabolism of the, of the placenta. As I say, it's a, it's a very highly active uh, tissue. It's uh, using a considerable portion of the total amount of oxygen that's supplied. Roughly a third goes to ionic pumping and this active transport, roughly a third to protein synthesis. Uh, and the main um, supply of uh, the, the energy supply is really coming uh, from glucose. And, and uh, we, we, we estimates are that about 70% of the glucose supplied to the fetoplacental unit is actually utilized by this tissue uh, uh, itself. So you have a bit of a unique situation. In, in that there is a danger that the, the placenta is, is interposed between the maternal supply line uh, and the fetal capillaries. And of course, if the trophoblast is using so much of that oxygen and nutrients, it is possibly depleting uh, the amount that can reach uh, the fetus. Uh, this is not the, the, the normal situation whereby nutrients in, 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 in ourselves are just simply going into the uh, the the, the, the um, cells of interest. You can improve that to a certain extent by indenting those capillaries into the trophoblast epithelium. As we saw earlier, the, the barrier is, is very, very thin in some areas. That allows you to sort of separate the two uh, demands. Some nutrients can pass into the trophoblast, others can bow directly go into the fetal capillaries without being uh, scavenged by the uh, placenta en route. So that, that, that helps to a certain amount and it will increase the amount of oxygen and nutrients which reach the uh, placenta. The other question though is, is whether you can actually change the demands of, of the trophoblast here uh, for oxygen, which would uh, again increase the amount of oxygen which is able to reach the fetus. And, and what we find is that the placenta, particularly uh, even under well oxygenated conditions, is still heavily reliant on uh, aerobic glycolysis. So that uh, most of the um, particularly in, in, in early pregnancy, what we find is, is that there, there is this sort of Warburg type of metabolism that is very reminiscent of, of what you see in, in, in the cancer cell. So it does uh, produce quite a bit of lactate. That is important because that can go to the fetus. The placenta can't use lactate, but the fetus can. Uh, and so... Uh, that there is a high production of lactate, but we also found uh, that, that there are high concentrations of these uh, sugar alcohols, the ribitol uh, and sorbitol, uh, particularly in early pregnancy. So by using these sort of pathways, um, we can regenerate NAD or NADH um, NADP, sorry, uh, through through the sorbitol pathways without necessarily having to come down to, to lactate. And so if we look, particularly in, in, in early pregnancy, uh, for these uh, concentrations here, we've got three different fluids. One is maternal serum. This is the salomic fluid, which is uh, the quite early in pregnancy inside what was the original blastocyst, that is the extra embryonic coelom, uh, and we're aspirating that fluid, which really is in communication with the placenta, uh, as opposed to the amniotic fluid, which is really in communication with the fetus itself. But what you find is that inositol, sorbitol, uh, erythritol, ribitol, all of these uh, polyols, these ancient um, sugar alcohols, uh, 
are in very much higher concentration, particularly in the salomic fluid, but also in the amniotic fluid than in the maternal serum. So these pathways which are used in Warburg metabolism are very, very active in the placenta. And I think that is a, is a way by which the placenta can um, prevent excessive consumption of oxygen. It still needs oxygen um, for its metabolism, uh, but it, it, it tries to constrain that uh, to um, to maximize the amount of oxygen that is crossing to the fetus. The one con thing that you do need to have um, to maintain that metabolism uh, is a good supply of, of, of glucose. And, and, and that's what you see in early pregnancy when the, the glands underneath the placenta are supplying large amounts of, of glucose and in fact glycogen accumulates within the trophoblast layer so that there's a huge amount of, of glycogen available for that different form of metabolism and if you've got a lot of glucose although you're not getting as much atp per molecule of, of glucose uh, you can maintain the metabolism without consuming too much oxygen so i just come back to this original sort of um, diagram that uh, we do have these environmental cues which we know affect uh, fetal outcome and adult programming, uh, but the placenta is, is, is sitting there in between. It is not just a uh, passive conduit, it is adapting to the maternal and nutritional state. It is, a, it is adapting to oxygen availability. It is trying to protect against uh, maternal stress with 11 beta HSD2. Uh, so that uh, I think this the, the, the placenta is playing a much more active role uh, along this pathway uh, than perhaps previously anticipated. So just to conclude, um, we always think of the, of the placenta as um, an organ of exchange and, and its whole structure really is set up for that by having a large surface area uh, and a thin barrier. But there are also a, a, a whole host of specific transporters for macro and micronutrients uh, that can respond uh, to the maternal diet and to fetal needs. It's a two-way dialogue. We have invasive actions, certainly, of the trophoblast that remodel the maternal spiral arteries. There are immune interactions involved in that process, um, and failure of remodeling is, is a major contributor to complications of pregnancy. The placenta also has profound endocrine actions, which are going to modulate the maternal metabolism and optimize the amount of nutrients available uh, to cross the placenta. Uh, but there are also adaptations, I think, in terms of placental metabolism to make sure that it doesn't consume too much oxygen. So you cannot equate the, the metabolism of the placenta with the metabolism of adult uh, cells. Uh, and also the uh, placenta is a, a selective barrier um, providing some protection but not complete protection against xenobiotics. So as uh, David Barker's influence was uh, enormous, uh, you know, it emphasizes how the first nine months shape the rest of your life and the placenta I think plays a, a very active role uh, in that shaping. So. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here today uh, and for your attention. Very interesting talk. Uh, I'm uh, curious, uh, forgive me for my ignorance, but is it easy to cultivate those trophoblasts uh, as you do in cell cultures? <laughs> 
that that is a, a so it gets really to the nub i think of, of placental research uh in the mouse uh, you can culture mouse trophoblast stem cells in the human nobody has been able to isolate yet a true trophoblast stem cell we have a variety of trophoblast cell lines mainly derived from choriocarcinomas so they're often um, aneuploid and, and they've got all sorts of chromosomal numbers what you can do is isolate the various trophoblast populations uh, uh, except for the syncytia trophoblast which being multinucleated is difficult to, 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 to culture. You can isolate the different populations and we can isolate the invasive cells, the non-invasive trophoblast, but they will not proliferate in vitro. And, and that's, that's something we're struggling with at the moment. Uh, so the hypoxia problem during preeclampsia and eclampsia, uh, according to what you showed, the requirements of oxygen by the placenta. So how does this? So is it the 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 lack of oxygen is a problem to the placenta or to the fetus? So this, can you elaborate? No, I'm not sure. But, uh, because there is a this a theory that you know the problem with the, the preeclampsia is a decrease in oxygen tension, and that's what you know the problem develops. But since placenta, you know, requirement for oxygen is not as high, so what what is the the, the thing? So again, every, you you always read that the placenta is hypoxic in preeclampsia because those arteries are not fully converted. There has not been a single measurement that has been taken to either prove or disprove that, that, that theory. Certainly the fetus is hypoxic. I think, you know, it is growth restricted and, and blood, cold blood measurements taken at the time of delivery show the fetus is hypoxic. That is not the same as saying that the placenta is hypoxic. Uh, my own take on, on the situation was that, and why we did that remodeling, was that dilating or not dilating just the distal part of an artery can't really impact on the amount of blood flow to the placenta because it's the more proximal parts of the artery which are going to be rate limiting. And that's what the calculations showed. So I, you know, there's no less blood getting to that placenta, but it is getting to the placenta at a very high rate. Uh, and also we think that because those vessels are not um, remodeled, they are constricting. And so if we take placental villi, expose them to hypoxia, not much happens. If you take them to villi, you make them hypoxic, and then you reintroduce oxygen, they show very high levels of oxidative stress, and then this sort of ischemia reperfusion injury. So we are working on the basis that in preeclampsia, it is not hypoxia, but it is more a, a, an ischemia reperfusion type injury that, that is taking place and, and that has a very different way in which the placenta responds because that is not a physiological situation that is much more a pathological situation and so you know in those cases you see placental infarcts you see a lot of changes associated with malperfusion if you like um, and, and, and that's not what you would see in the high altitude placenta if you go to a normal placenta from high altitude, they, they look very, very nice. They, they do not show the hallmarks of, of preeclampsia. So I think uh, the preeclampsia is a ischemia reperfusion type injury, causes placental pathology. That then has knock-on effects for the fetus. But that's, 
the mitochondria, I mean, what we, what we see um, in, in preeclampsia, I showed you uh, those IUGR placentas, there, were, there was a lot of dilation in the syncytiotrophoblast. That dilation is of the endoplasmic reticulum. So in the IUGR, and the, particularly in the preeclamptic placentas, what we see is a lot of endoplasmic reticulum stress. And this is activation of the unfolded protein response, and one of the consequences of that is that you suppress protein translation. And we see mitochondrial complexes going down in those situations so that the mitochondrial RNA for the different complexes remains constant, but at the protein level, uh, the, 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 those are reduced. So I think we, we, we do see an increase in AM, yes, AMP against ATP. Uh, there is activation probably of AMP kinase uh, and there is, uh, but uh, there's no reduction, I don't think, in, in necessarily in mitochondrial number, but they are probably, uh, the complexes are, are compromised to a certain extent. Um, yeah. Sorry to be a pest here, but uh, uh, this is another thing that occurred to me. You can draw a parallel between trophoblasts and metastatic cells, I suppose. And uh, what uh, is there any information as to what stops them at the endometrium, for example? Yep. Uh, I mean, a number of people have, have drawn that comparison, and, and they look... The, the, the true invasive trophoblast cells look very much like a, a metastatic carcinoma cell. Loads of people have, have tried to understand what regulates trophoblast invasion. Nobody has really come up with the answer to your question, which is what stops invasion as much as what promotes invasion. We've all looked at it as why isn't invasion uh, as, as why is it impaired in these cases of IUGR? But the, the reverse of that is, well, what stops it under normal situations? It normally stops in the, mid, uh, in, in, in the inner third of the myometrium. And at that point, the invasive trophoblast cells fuse together to form a multinucleated, what's called a giant cell. Uh, and that is just in the inner third of the myometrium. There are no natural killer cells in the myometrium. There are very few macrophages. So what it is that actually stops those cells and induces the, the, um, the migration is, is, is not clear. Um, it is important that they reach that point because that's where the very contractile segment of those spiral arteries is. So at perhaps as they come down through the endometrium, they are programmed in some way to, to, to stop in a, in a short distance. If you don't have the endometrium, then they will go straight on. So in an in a ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube where you don't have endometrium, they will migrate right the way through. If you have a cesarean scar, they will go straight through. Uh, and that is an increasing complication of pregnancies with greater uh, incidence of cesarean sections. So there's something about the decidua, and it is likely to be the immune cells within the decidua, but exactly what those signals are, we don't know. If you take the non-invasive, <coughs> excuse me, in some species, there's no trophoblast invasion at all. So in the pig, there's no invasion. But if you take those trophoblasts and put them under the kidney capsule, then they'll invade. So something normally restrains that trophoblast invasiveness. <clears throat> 
but we don't know yet what. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you.